Folks, this is a tough episode because we originally, I say the collective royal we, meaning myself mainly, had an amazing idea for an episode. Eric rebuked it. He said, I, I, I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself because once again, we collectively rule uh, the Iron Cult with our iron fists atop the pyramid, naked, basking in glory. We're going to talk, this is the backup episode, and I can see the high utility. My original proposal for Eric, I thought, you know, we got to jump on what Netflix is doing and all these other large uh, corporate conglomerates, and we need to do something interactive. So I said, hey, Eric, I want to see you posing. And he said, you ask Mm. me this all the time. And I said, no, 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 but it'll be for the cult. So it'll be a live react. We know on YouTube, reacts get all the views. Mukbangs, or I might be mispronouncing that. I apologize. But like, you know, eating food, talking about things. I said, what if you just get into your trunks, pose, and I'll just critique it or like admire it more like for maybe an hour, hour and a half. Your first, your first objection, you said, I just don't think there'd be enough content. And I said, no, trust me, I can analyze you for hours and hours. That's not the issue. Um... The second one, you said, I don't know if the audience would enjoy it. And I said, I am the audience and I already know I'll enjoy it. That's insulting that you think that I don't know what I want. Um, And then I forget your third reason. But here we are. We we had that. It it was a a, quite frankly, a lengthy conversation, Eric, before we decided on this episode. But that leads us to where we are right now. Yeah. And and just to so you know (laughs) that I do value your thoughts. I did think about, okay, how can we take this? Uh, take take the take the elements that we both like and move forward. Mm-hmm. And I think you're on to something with reactions. Mm. And I actually think our future episodes, we should start from the first one. We should have our podcast episodes playing live and we react to our own episodes. I think that would be fire. Like <laughs> uh, we, like episode 139, Omar and Eric react to episode one. So... <laughs> Hey, just hit us up in the comments, hit us up on Instagram, let us know which episodes you want us to react to, uh, and it's going to be like Mystery Science Theater 3000 for ourselves, and I think uh, it's, it's going to be huge, folks. So I, I've, so Omar, the seed you planted didn't grow the tree you thought it might, right. but the tree that's going to grow is going to be one that we'll both react to in great glory. Wow, you, you, man, you managed to get me, Eric. I suppose it'd be too late because we would, I, I'm recording this live right now. I'd have to bring up maybe the first episode. I would have to assume, and I don't want to do that, what the audience would want to see us react to first, what episode. Mm. So let's go with, let, let's call it the backup episode. Uh, Eric, you propose something very interesting. I would say it's an incredibly strong number two idea. We'll, we'll That number one, the reacts, we'll put it aside. But can you just give a brief description of what you're telling me um, prior to us recording this episode that is simply fascinating. Oh, yeah. This will be a strong number two. Yeah. So um, we're going to take this number two, and we're going to squeeze it out, and you guys are just going to – you're going to love what this this episode smells like, I tell you that much. So uh, there's a paper that recently came out um, called Daily Ener- Energy Expenditure Through the Human Life, Life Course, and it is by none other than Herman Ponser, who has been um, a very uh, popular – Science Voice in, in, in recent times is getting a lot of press these days. Um, there's books written by him, and he's the one who proposed the constrained model of energy expenditure. So you've probably heard us talk about on, on Iron Culture before uh, the Hadza, uh, and I think that's the first time on Iron Culture I've correctly pronounced uh, and, and not dyslexified the D and the Z. Um, so first off, hats off to me, uh, and I'm tempted to take my hat off, but I'm going to leave it on because my hair's messed up. Uh, But, uh, yeah, so he is the one who looked at how uh, the total daily energy expenditure does not continually and linearly rise as you increase increase activity, uh, that it does actually get curtailed. Of course, it still goes up. This isn't a, you know, a perfect correction. And there's a a very big misnomer in the public perception of his work that suggests that there is a limit to human daily energy expenditure and that somehow we can completely compensate – for, uh, for exercise or activity, which is not the case. It is just not linear. Uh, humans have a tough time dealing with, with complex ideas, but not you, dear cultists. So you know that. I'm just telling you things you already know. But once again, uh, Herman Ponser was a leader on this paper that looked at, again, energy expenditure, and they had some really interesting findings. And this was actually a huge 
collaborative paper um, that used a uh, an open database. So this is another example of how powerful open science can be. This is something that, you know, how many times have we talked about, Omar, how like small sample size studies can lead us to erroneous conclusions or just make it very difficult to us to have a lot of confidence in what we have in the whole like lifting world. Uh, this study had like 6,421 people in it, and it came from a database that's close to 7,000 people in it. And it's all because uh, a lot of researchers all around the world were making the effort to create uh, one of these databases that is open access. It's called the doubly labeled water uh, database. So anyway, um, so this paper, ton of authors recently came out, and it is basically just this expose on how energy expenditure, total daily energy expenditure, not basal metabolic rate, um, changes throughout the human life course. Uh, and among these over 6,000 participants in this study, or I should say, because uh, it wasn't actually a study, it was an analysis of existing data of all of these individuals, um, we had people who were as young as eight days old and people who were as old as 95 years old. Uh, and it was uh, it had, a, had a lot of both uh, males and females in it. I think it was uh, almost two-thirds women. And it was from 29 different countries. So it is a really, really robust analysis uh, of, of kind of humanity, really. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool paper. Uh, and there, there's a lot to go over in it. So I think uh, we've talked about, I mean, d we've talked about this a lot. We've talked about how uh, the quote-unquote idea of metabolic damage uh, or just, you know, metabolic adaptation. We've had guests on to talk about it. We've talked about what to do about it in the context of bodybuilding. We've talked about the recovery diet. We've talked about the reverse diet. Um, we've talked about dealing with quote-unquote metabolic adaptations in the practical application. But I think this is, though there are going to be practical applications from this. Don't get me wrong. But I think this is just a really interesting exposure of how some of the beliefs we have about our quote-unquote metabolisms are actually not accurate, or at least not nuanced enough, uh, which is, I think, is really interesting. So Omar, I want to cover three main things with this episode. I want to talk about, one, uh, the apparent lack of sex differences, uh, and, and where those uh, things that we perceive as sex differences actually come from in, in energy expenditure. I want to talk about the effect of age which I think is probably what startles the most people when they come across this paper, uh, the time point when your energy expenditure actually truly starts to decline um, and on, on a relative level. And I'll explain what that means. And then finally, I want to talk about just how crazy individual differences can be. Eric, this, this truly is a monster episode. And I, so I don't want to undersell it all. There's three things I want to mention very quickly. One, Mass monthly applications in strength sports. It's coming up actually by the time it's out. It basically will be out. It's the October issue. Is that correct, Eric? Yeah, it's coming out October 1st. So by the time you're listening to this podcast, it will be out. And if you're like, man, I hate Eric's voice. I much prefer reading his words and thinking of, of someone else's voice. And honestly, I understand. Uh, you may, maybe you read it in the voice of Omar. You try to get the best of both worlds. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you, you have your option. You can either read my word, uh, or you can, you can listen to our words or you can do one or the other. You got a lot of options here. No, Eric, uh, truly what, uh, everyone's doing over at mass, what you're contributing to the general conversation can't be understated. And so I would implore everyone listening. If you want to read further about this to subscribe to mass, there will be a link in the description before Eric goes in on this topic. The second point I would say is that for me, Eric, what you're about to describe is incredibly positive news, which we kind of rarely have, because I think it'll help mm. reframe things for everyone listening, right? There are these preconceived notions that we have about the metabolism as we age and kind of the general topic, which we'll have after of entropy that we kind of decline over time. And I, I view this as being positive because it shows the robustness of humans, uh, very actionable, clear steps that we can all do to try and slow down some of that entropy um, and, and basically meet that final deload, if you will, the inevitable deload we'll all experience. And then uh, third is what I love about this episode is that you relate it back to our tonic, which is we have that it is our catch line. We don't like say it's not the you know catchphrase we say in every episode, like iron culture, united, uh, uniting all lifters or for all lifters. But we do mean that where we want people there. There is a high utility in pursuing exercise or some sort of physical movement uh, for basically the entirety of your existence. And this might be one of the best pitches if you ever wanted like kind of a soft pitch of like, hey, like what are some of the benefits of moving or keeping active, staying active now as you age in a variety of different modalities and ways. That, that's what I love too. It's so open-ended. It's not saying like, hey, like Eric, 
keep picking up a barbell for the next 30 years. There's just some really positive takeaways from what you're about to say. So, man, the floor is yours. I know there's three major uh, topics to cover and so much more. Let's get after it. No, I, thank you, and I absolutely will. And it, it's interesting. I think I think we're probably going to go off on some meta tangents here where we talk about kind of the underlying philosophy or at least the the natural human reactions to some of the beliefs we have. And I think this wasn't wasn't something I intended when I wrote the article or that I intend when we discuss it, but I know we'll get there, is just how some very fatalistic or nihilistic narratives come out of some of these beliefs, which, I mean, I'm, I'm all for realism, and I'm, I'm all for people having truths, and I do understand, like you said, there will be a final deload for everyone. <laughs> um, but related to not only age, but also uh, sex differences and even individual differences or sometimes a lack thereof, uh, there there tends to be these narratives that I think are very uh, counterproductive uh, that go on in the fitness industry. Whether that's, um, look, you're, you're limited in this way. Uh, it always comes down to these imposed limitations, which may or may not be based on fact, or they're far not, not, not nuanced enough to be uh, accurately representative. And ultimately, they seem to just result in, well, let me just throw my hands up. Uh, instead of finding a you know the the best possible way forward, and I do think you know it's understandable to have those times, and a lot of the times what you see when you see nihilistic comments online are people in moments of frustration. So don't get you know too wrapped up into that, and that's you know we all have those moments. But I think unintended benefit of this episode is you might let go of some of those those beliefs that that may have previously limited you and have maybe. Uh, new opportunities for self-efficacy. Let's put it that way, all right? So first one up is, is is sex differences. And we've talked about this a little bit before on Iron Culture. We had Sohi and Greg go into this a good bit. Um, but yeah, so the interesting thing, uh, so let, let's get back into kind of the methods of this study just a little bit. I don't want to bog people down with, with the hardcore science, but I think it's kind of interesting. So I mentioned the, uh, the doubly labeled water uh, method, and that's where this database was. Doubly labeled water is what's called like the gold standard in measuring energy expenditure. Uh, and very simply, what they do is they, gi they give people water and have them drink it, and it has uncommon isotopes of both uh, uh, of, of deuterium and oxygen. So it's got oxygen 18 and deuterium in it, um, and these are, you can isotopically trace them. So you can see their kinetics or the way they, they operate in the body, and, and you can track how they are removed from the body. And the interesting aspect of these is that uh, the, these hydrogen and oxygen isotopes, they are eliminated differently. So, for example, oxygen exits the body through breathing and losses of water, while deuterium only exits the body through losses of water, which allows you to estimate carbon dioxide production, you know, which is what we breathe out, right? Now, for anyone who's familiar with how we measure uh, BMR, basal metabolic rate, we use that with indirect calorimetry. You got the metabolic hoods, or you actually have a really expensive actual metabolic chamber, and you can measure everything because you can capture uh, the, the, the gas exchanges, right? Now, you can do that, you, you, rather, you can estimate that with doubly labeled water because you can look at the difference between um, the, the, the losses of both of these, uh, hence doubly labeled uh, isotopes, deuterium and oxygen 18, and you can see, okay, therefore, we can calculate carbon dioxide production and subsequently energy expenditure. But the cool thing is that even if you've got one of those super expensive metabolic wards, you're heavily altering someone's day-to-day -day activity if they're stuck in a room. Basically, a one-room apartment is what even the most expensive of these look like. Or if you've got them in a lab doing basal metabolic rate, well, how do I get to, from basal metabolic rate to total daily energy expenditure, which is what most people in our world want to know. They want to figure out how to set up a surplus, a deficit, maintenance, et cetera, or just to get an idea of what my energy expenditure is so we can figure out how my body composition may or may not change, right? So it's typically a nutritional tool. So what do you do with the BMR data? Well, you have to multiply it by an activity factor. And unfortunately, that's an estimation. So you get these multiple compounding errors. You get the inherent error with BMR, and you have to make some assumptions about activity levels. And most people in our world don't know how to use these activity levels that are out there. So it's either you're like, like what, what do you do if you don't have an active job, but you do work out? That's not on the table. You know, you can either be a construction <laughs> worker or you can be a, an athlete, but you can't like have a sedentary job but work out. So most people in the modern world who lift weights or exercise with any type uh, of activity, 
they're going to have they're going to struggle to find the appropriate physical activity modifier. So enter doubly labeled water, where you simply give people some water. Uh, you 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 measure uh, their the, the difference between that and a few days later, and they can go about their regular lives, and you get this gold standard measurement that is highly accurate and highly reliable of total daily energy expenditure. Right. So this is great. There are some limitations of it, and that might be related to specific diets and other applications. But for just measuring total daily energy expenditure, it's quite accurate in the general population. Um, and another cool aspect of it is that because you're looking at losses of, and changes in body water, you can actually estimate body composition. So in this database, they also have like height, weight, demographics, sex, age, etc., all that good stuff. Um, and since they have weight, and since they have body water, um, the hydration of fat-free mass is relatively constant, especially when we're talking about such a large sample size as this. If we want to talk about large numbers, any kind of error there is enough that we can work with and be very confident in our findings. So if you can calculate fat-free mass, and if you have total body mass, therefore, the remainder is fat mass. So we basically have a two-compartment body model, uh, sorry, body composition model from everyone in this uh, in this database, and we also have their total daily energy expenditure, and we have their demographics data. So what the authors did was they used this huge database to look at changes throughout the lifespan relating body composition to total daily energy expenditure in a free living environment. And then the final thing I'll say on the methods is that they also have on about two thousand of the subjects. Uh, who are in this analysis, uh, they have their BMR. So they can also do some calculations on different components of energy expenditure. So BMR, basal metabolic rate, or resting metabolic rate, is how many calories you expend just living without actually including physical activity. At rest, uh, you know, low heart rate, not moving, like type of energy expenditure you'd have when you sleep, etc. So if you have total daily energy expenditure, and if you have RMR, you can therefore also calculate physical activity, which is what's remaining after also subtracting an estimation for the thermic effect of feeding, which is just roughly 10% of your total daily energy expenditure, unless you are on a really high or really low protein or fiber diet. Um, but again, large population study, that's something you, you can assume is a relatively constant estimation over time. So hopefully I didn't go too in depth there, Omar, but do you think the, 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 the cult understands these methods? 100%. And I can only assume that as they measure this population, anyone over 30, their metabolism is just going to plummet. And they're basically, it's, I don't want to say it's not worth living after 30, but like, Eric, we know how it goes, right? Activity level, metabolism, 30. Why lift? Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not that it's not worth living. It's just that what you do after the age of 30 couldn't be considered living uh, right. because you burn, you know, I don't know, no calories, essentially. <laughs> Um, <laughs> actually, yeah, we could start with the age one. Why, why not? I think I was going to go towards sex, but, but let's use that segue. I think we've all had since we started getting into lifting, especially if we're in like, let's say a weight gain phase when we're in a slight surplus, uh, and, and, you know, relative to the average person in our family, we, we look good, even though we're gaining weight, we're gaining some body fat. And so, you know, we get together for a holiday or you see your family and that one uncle or aunt or cousin who is older than you says, you know, you're, you can eat that much and look that way now, but once you hit insert age, either 30, like you said, <laughs> or 40, 30, the third, the 30 ones are hilarious. Cause it really just means that person really let things go. Um, <laughs> But, you know, most of the time they're going to insert the ages of 40 yep. or 50. And it's basically like, hey, once you hit middle age, things are going to change. Everything changes. Um, and I think, well, well, for one, let me just say that while this finding that I'm going to say is probably the most controversial to the general public, I think if you've been hanging out in like the drug-free lifting world, um, it's very difficult to really blame a whole lot on age with certain people out there like, like Dave Ricks who squatted a PR total at the age of 57, putting up like 830 in the 93 kilo class, uh, setting world records in the open division. Uh, the dude at 61 just totaled over 800 kilos at 93 at, at Raw Nationals, placed 10th in the open division. That's an elite total, <laughs> folks. He's 61. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then like I saw in person, Marshall Johnson in his early 50s beat Alberto Nunez in the Pro USA, and he lost by one point to Doug Miller, who, when he was in his 50s as well. Doug Miller, the, the goat of natural bodybuilding, so much to the point where if you say he's the goat of natural bodybuilding, 70% of the people in the room be like, yeah, not natty, you know? So uh, nonetheless, when, when you see people like this who are still crushing it in their 50s, uh, and even their 60s in some cases, 
it is very difficult to to really put too much of an emphasis on age. Now, of course, I'm talking about outliers. You know, I'm talking about the genetic elite, and I'm also talking about like strength and physique, not necessarily uh, you know energy expenditure. But these are actually closely linked. So. Sure. Eric, one thing I'll just say quickly is that even if besides the outliers, if we look at lifelong lifters, we make the joke here uh, in mm -hmm. the cult and their ability to retain their muscularity as they age, there's numerous examples. of So it doesn't matter even if they're outliers, if you have average genetics, but you've been lifting for a long period of time, you know, uh, accumulating a certain amount of uh, muscle mass, 30s, 40s, 50s, I think people would be surprised how much you can maintain or in some uh, places, depending upon what you've done over those 10, 20, 30 years even make progress in so it, it mm -hmm. doesn't even have to be the best of the best it's it's such encouraging news i think for anyone if you're just willing to look because we had that like we'll have it at the end of the whole uh, nihilism conversation there's a lot of really great indicators clearly out there already i think for people if they just paid attention yeah and i i think i think the um some of the complementary uh analyses they did in this study if you look at some of the supplementary data they 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 analyzed other studies, and they, they kind of pointed out maybe why people are having this disconnect with what they reported. Because the, what they reported, brace yourselves, folks, is that the primary explain, explanatory variable for total daily energy expenditure is fat-free mass. That's not going to surprise anybody, you know, how much fat-free mass you have. And by the way, fat-free mass is not just muscle mass, and that's an important point we're going to get to later. That includes your organ mass, which is some of the most metabolically active, highest uh, per, per relative unit weight energy expending uh, tissue in the human body, right? Uh, so your organs burn the most, that's fat-free mass. Uh, muscle tissue also burns a lot of calories, not relative to organs, but definitely relative to fat uh, and other tissues that, that aren't organs. So anyway, fat-free mass explains uh, the vast majority of the variability in total daily energy expenditure. And it's quite, uh, it, it's a proportional relationship. So it's not quite linear. Uh, it's linear in like one one lifespan phase, and this is where it's stable, from the age of 20 to 60. So that means if you are 20 and you are 60 and you, you know, meet the characteristics of the general, uh, you know, person who is analyzed in this study, which is a good representative of all people, if you maintain the same activity level and if you maintain the same level of muscle mass from your 20s to your late 50s up to the age of 60, you will have a very similar total daily energy expenditure. Now, I think... That is probably like a no way to, to most people who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. They look at what they did in their 20s and 30s, and they're not eating as much. Now, the reason why that might be is if you look at, like I said, in the supplementary data, they look at other research in this area. If you look at physical activity data from other studies where they have accelerometers on people and they track how many calories they expend through physical activity throughout, a life, throughout their lifespan, that starts to drop off in the 40s. Generally, people are more active when they're 20, more active when they're 30, or sorry, more active when they're 20 and 30 compared to their 40s, 50s, and just steadily declines until they physically can't move anymore because they're not alive. So, <laughs> so now here's the thing is that we know what causes us to gain fat-free mass. It's moving against heavy things, right? So lifting weights obviously is not only what builds fat-free mass, but it's also what maintains it. And in the general population who aren't generally lifting, fat-free mass is modified by just general activity. So the less active you get, the more fat-free mass you lose. So when you talk about the average 50-year-old, they are burning fewer calories compared to when they are 20. But it's not because of some intrinsic physiological change. They're, the relative energy expenditure for each unit of fat-free mass is still the same. The problem is that they have less fat-free mass because they're moving less. So ultimately, this tells us that it is incredibly important to maintain our activity levels if we want to maintain our fat-free mass, if we want to therefore maintain the same energy expenditure throughout our, our entirety of our adult life. Uh, until we actually reach old age. And yes, after the age of 60, so in your kind of early middle age or late middle aged years into early uh, old age, there is a reduction in the relative energy expenditure of fat free mass. And this means that uh, your, your organs aren't burning as many calories, right? Uh, and there may be some unavoidable losses of fat free mass and that efficiency may actually uh, go down a little bit. So you probably experiencing sarcopenia as well as changes in, at the organ tissue level of energy expenditure. So yeah, of course, there is a point 
where it is inevitable that even if you maintain activity, even if you manage to maintain muscle mass into your late 60s, you're probably going to be burning a few less calories because of uh, age-related changes. But the point at which that happens is, depending on who you talk to, one, two, or three decades later than the average person expects, which I think is 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 pretty shocking finding for most people. No, Eric, Eric I, think about this for a second. Most people, what they would attribute that person at the dinner table, the uncle, the aunt, saying, hey, wait till you get to be my age. And they think that it's just age catching up with them. But to your point, their activity drops off, let's say, in their late 30s or in their 40s. So they're less physically active. They are slowly losing the muscle mass. Not that they maybe try to accumulate, but, you know, you have a, a certain amount uh, uh, in your 20s and 30s. You lose that. Then everything uh, starts being downregulated. You start packing on uh, weight because you're eating the same amount of food. Or maybe, you know, if we take a look at different populations, like uh, 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 certain populations, maybe even increasing the calories over time. All that combined, your overall body composition is looking worse and worse each year. But it, they attribute it to a, like this global age, like my metabolism is slowing down. Um, can you talk to me a little bit? Maybe the pitch, because there are a lot of, I, I, I would I think it's a great split with the Iron Cult based on uh, the comments I've seen, the people leaving comments. I would say probably the majority are between like 20 to 40. But mm. even those listening, can you give that pitch, Eric, why one should remain physically active? How it, Actually, you could make the argument, a strong argument, it becomes more and more important as you age. So I think a lot of people kind of pick up lifting in their 20s and 30s, drop it off at some point because you know, a variety of different you know life uh, uh, factors. And then they maybe don't pick it up again, but it's almost like the opposite. You want to accumulate theoretically the most amount of muscle you can before the age of 60 to give yourself the best chance as you continue to age, like things, even like fall, uh, falling factors, if we're talking like mm -hmm. 70, 80 and so forth. But can you just frame that conversation here? Because I think it would help out people that maybe, you know, we are tied and like, oh, I'm not getting stronger, Eric. Like, oh, I think I reached my genetic camp, Eric, in terms of building muscle. Like, why even keep lifting? It becomes more and more important, basically, the older you get. And that that just remains until the final deload. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So uh, I, I recently had a, one of our, our 3DMJ meetings where we, we meet uh, twice a month and just talk about the status of 3D muscle journey and how everyone's doing. And we do, you know, personal check-ins because we, we're, we're, we're like a family and we need to know how we, each other are doing. And, uh, you know, Brad and Jeff are, are both 50. And, and they were expressing, and by the way, they both have a ton of muscle mass and, and they're good examples of people who are, um, you know, handling the effects of age. But they still are effects of age, right? So don't, don't get me wrong just because we're looking at energy expenditure here. And it does make it harder. Um, and one of the things that Jeff joked about is like, you know, anytime I start to feel bad about my age, you know, like I have to put on my reading glasses, uh, or, I, or I feel a little more creaky than normal. I just look up my old high school buddies and, and, and see how they're doing, you know, compared to me, yeah. oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, and I think, I think that's the selling point is that the, the listeners of iron culture, the, you are not the unmuscular, unwashed masses that, that this study <laughs> you know, represents, you know, you were, you were the few, you were the proud, you were the jacked. And, um, you, you, to some degree, I think what I'm telling the listeners is, is messages they should, they should proselytize to their family and their friends, uh, or, or the, those who get captured by nihilism and, and begin to stop lifting or, 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 or not take it as, uh, as religiously as they currently do. We need to maintain that fervor, if you will, um, so, so two things I'll say. One, I do want to pitch a, a low density bone out to the, uh, to the to the older listeners. Is one, things do get harder. So it's easy to say that you should maintain activity levels to therefore maintain muscle mass, and you will therefore see a maintenance of energy expenditure. But it's another thing to say, well, do that despite the fact that you have more injuries now. Uh, despite the fact that it is more painful to do a lot of the movements you used to love, that you're a little more limited, and that maybe you have more demands in your life now than you did when you were 20. So I think that can't be overstated. I, I, I don't want this to come across as just saying, hey, people get lazy in their 40s, move less, lose muscle, and then they, then they yell at their younger uh, you know, family members at, at, at Christmas and, and holidays about how they have it so easy and how life is going to be terrible. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, yes, it's going to be harder to keep training the way you are now. Yes, it's going to be hard to maintain muscle mass or potentially even gain it, like Omar said, as you get into middle age. Uh, yes, you don't necessarily have the same time. Uh, yes, you may not even have the same relationship with lifting where it has that same fire that made it so easy to lift on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes it's not even fun. You know, like, oh, I got to do leg day and my knees, my backs, and my hip is all aching. 
You know, as someone who has been lifting now for 17 years and who is in his late 30s, I'm experiencing that now. So I can only expect that it's going to be a little bit harder when I'm not 38, but I'm 48 or 58. So heart goes out. Uh, and definitely this isn't just a shame on you for being a lazy middle-aged person episode. But what I am saying is that that's the only difficulty you have. We don't need to make it any harder by making up stories about the effects of middle age that actually aren't there for the physiological reasons we think they are. So the narrative needs to shift a little bit. Your fat-free mass is going to predict your energy expenditure until you hit the very last quarter of your life. And that's pretty much the name of the game. Um, so that means you probably have more motivation now to fight tooth and nail to maintain your activity levels, to maintain your muscle mass, so that you can have a similar energy expenditure and not see other declines in health uh, and quality of life that would also be associated with a decline in energy expenditure. So that's the big take-home message and that, that I would put out there to people is, one, if you're listening, we're probably not talking about you primarily, but bring the good word to your fellows <laughs> and 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 fellettes who, who are not lifting. Um, and, and help them understand this. And two, absolutely, it's going to be harder, even, even though this, this data doesn't change your subjective experience by any means. It just clarifies it. So, yeah, I think, I think that should address uh, that aspect, Omar. Eric, incredibly well put. I appreciate also that uh, sympathy and empathy for everyone listening, because all too often, that to me is the hallmark of a terrible coach, where you just, mm -hmm. it's top down. We spoke about that, the hierarchy. It's like, this is what you need to do without considering the human experience, the individual differences that someone might be facing, their own subjective experience undertaking this journey and how it might be a vast differences compared to what you and myself are currently experiencing. It's like, oh, you don't, uh, oh, it, it is harder for you? Like, oh, your relationship, like, why, but why don't you like lifting? It's like, oh, man, do we really want to unpack this? So I would ask you, Eric, before we get over uh, the sex differences or the perception of uh, this um, is there anything that you want to talk about as it relates to age first before we move on to that topic? Yeah, yeah. I do want to just validate people's observations a little more. So one cool piece of supplementary data uh, that, that Ponser and colleagues presented was just pure body composition changes with age in the general population. So not lifters, uh, you know, not doing the, the relative changes of energy expenditure to body composition, but just looking at body composition. Because I think, you know, we're, we're humans. We, we're, we're pattern recognition machines. So the things that, you know, it's not like just random myths that are that are rooted in nothing other than, uh, you know, made-up fantasy stories or what's being peddled to you by your middle-aged family members at, at holidays. They are observing these things among themselves and their friends. So uh, body mass tends to peak right around 50 years of age. Uh, in, in both men and women, between like 40 to 60, that's when body mass is its highest, right? At that same time, uh, that is when fat mass also peaks. So the reason why people weigh more in their middle age is because they have more fat mass. And I'm not saying why, this is just what. This is just how what we observe it. Everything I talked about previously was explaining some of the mechanisms. And mechanisms don't contradict the observations, but they do help us understand why it's happening and therefore what we can do about it. So fat-free mass starts to decline around the 50s and 60s in the general population. And that is also when you start to see some critical losses of physical activity. So if you see physical activity going down in middle aged, uh, we see the general body composition trends of higher body mass coinciding with higher fat mass, coinciding with the start of the decline in fat-free mass. Uh, and, and therefore, body fat percentage, because that will go up whether you gain fat or lose muscle, uh, that also starts to, to hit its peak right around 40 or 50. So people are observing, it's harder, I look worse, and I feel worse in my middle-aged uh, phase of life. So I, I don't want to, to invalidate that. But another interesting aspect of age is some, some interesting things happen, and this isn't necessarily actionable, but it's just something, something to know, is that body mass starts to decline after 60. It starts to drop, and it kind of continues to decline. And there's some, some, and that goes with losses of both fat mass and fat-free mass. Um, fat mass stays relatively constant until like the last or one or two decades of life, and then it starts to drop off. And there's some interesting effects of age, um, and this is something that's important for those of you who have elderly uh, friends or family to be aware of, is that you start to lose um, the, the, the same pleasure you get from, from food. So uh, there are a number of physiological changes related to age that impact 
uh, not only activity, which is why you start to see these losses in fat-free mass, uh, but also energy uh, intake. So it's very common for people's appetites to start falling off with age, for them to have more potential gastrointestinal problems, uh, and to also see changes in other aspects that result in an overall loss of body mass and sometimes being in a malnourished state. So that's just something to be aware of. That's why things like meals on wheels are important and other things like that, that as people age, they do start to just lose mass in general once we're talking like the last one or two decades of life. So just, just be aware of that. It's not kind of this upward trend where people just continually gain fat because energy expenditure goes down later in life. There's a lot of signals that impact uh, body composition. And even though your energy expenditure is at its lowest relative and in an absolute sense when you're, say, 75 or 80 compared to every year earlier than that in your lifespan, um, that still might be when you weigh the least amount because of these other effects that have uh, impacted appetite and your ability to consume food. So that's the last thing I wanted to say about age. But I just think it's a, while it's not a huge population of our listeners, yeah. I know a lot of people have grandparents or, or, or elder friends. So it's something to consider. Eric, I can't wait to see the comment on the YouTube channel. You can go ahead and leave that comment for the person who is 70, 75, 80, 85 and saying, I listen to the call. And I'm a proud member. We're like, hell yeah. It's like, remember, we, we made that remark, I think, in one episode where I think we said something uh, along the lines. Well, that would apply to elite level lifters. So not you. And then there's two or three people. And I clicked on two of the profiles. And these people were incredibly strong. They had like YouTube profiles and their totals. It's like, excuse me, I apologize. So we we probably, you know, what? I am willing to bet, Eric, not even just family members of ours that basically uh, not pitiless in us, but you know, they want to they want to support <laughs> they want to support their their nephews and their their grandchildren. I'm like, yeah, listen, I don't understand what you're saying, but I under, uh, yeah, listen, um, that are out there. What I really heard from that is that, as Dave Tate said, weight moves weight. My powerlifting peak will, is going to be at 50. Uh, it's just uh, two decades away. You just got to wait a little bit. Your weight moves weight. Get that sodium bloat. Go to the all-you-can-eat sushi buffet. You said Dave Ricks was hitting PRs in his 50s. We now know the reason. Yeah, I would compete at 83 kgs at the moment. But we're looking at 105. Or Eric, I think I could push it to 120 kgs uh, at 50. I think that's the goal. So is, did I interpret that right? Or yeah, You nailed it. And, Thank you. And if... if 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 powerlifters from 2002 got anything right, is that if you're if, that if you're over five six, you should be a super heavyweight, and, and that that that's what I learned. So uh, Omar, you nailed it, and and I think uh, just just put more olive oil on that large pizza, and you're ready to rock, baby. Oh man, I I am not going to go on that tangent there because this is this is a powerful episode. We spoke before about you know our tour, the Masculinity in Crisis tour. And I got to be honest, Eric, mm. people were dropping off. They were dropping off because people were feeling more assured of themselves, understanding that their lifting and how much they lift is not necessarily a reflection of their masculinity. And they're coming to terms with themselves. But there's going to be something we talk about, about either the perceived sex differences uh, when it comes to uh, one's metabolism that may not be true, that I think are going to lead some of those people that had that newfound sense of confidence, that very tenuous, you know, super, su incredibly superficial level of confidence where they just got it. I think it might cause them to spiral out of control. And you, my friend, are setting us up for a very successful masculinity and crisis tour, I think, for 2022. Yeah, I, I th this one was tough for me because I... I firmly stand behind the values of the Masculine <laughs> Crisis Tour, and I say that without laughing as I laugh. Right. Um, but at the same time, I'm also a man of science, uh, a man of science. <laughs> <A> man. <laughs> okay. And uh, so it's, it's, I, think, I think I have to stand by the facts. So for all of you um, macro misogynists out there, who who you 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 find the women and you just you just throw down your macros and be like, I know that's more than yours. Uh, I think. I think, unfortunately, you may be the victim of false comparisons, and uh, you're going to have to to stop throwing those down like you have some inherent advantage. So I know I'm probably losing us our, our final two people from our, our Masculine in Crisis tour. It was a it was a party of five before <laughs> me, you, and the three people we had. <laughs> right. uh, so now we're down to one with the loss of these new two two uh, two two participants. But I think if we just raise the prices from twenty thousand dollars per ticket yeah. to uh, sixty will break even uh, with the same amount. So, uh, so Tom, <laughs> unfortunately, good news is it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one seminar one -on -one. with me and Omar uh, and you. 
uh, which is two on one. But you know what I mean. <laughs> he but, won. But, Tom, but, Tom, Tom, Tom's down with the two on one. It's a, it's not absolutely. a mastermind, Eric. It's an ultra mastermind premium. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. But and then and, and that premium <laughs> reason is why it has a premium price of now sixty thousand dollars for uh, two hours of our time. So anyway, um, here's the data, and here here's where we're going to lose these uh, those other two gentlemen. Um, those other two beta alphas, <laughs> yeah, alphas alpha. outside of our, 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 our tour, is that it seems that there actually are no sex differences in energy expenditure. Now, this is, I would say, probably not as, to get real for a moment, this is probably not as strongly or as widely believed as the age-related ones that, hey, once you hit middle-aged, energy expenditure kind of has this age-related decline. We now know it's actually a body composition-related decline. But I think the general observation people have is that men tend to burn more, more calories than women. And on, on average, that's true. But again, that's a function of at the same body mass, uh, men have more lean body mass and less fat mass on average. Also, men generally, the average, like if you just compare the bell curves, like of course there are women who are seven feet tall, like don't get me wrong. And there are women who are incredibly muscular and stronger than you. You know, we've had them on this podcast. Um, I remember when Amanda Lawrence was like, you know how it is when you're getting a close to a 500 pound squat and training, it's just, ah, oh, you're tired of it? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, as of, as of, as of fake nationals, I, I am starting to know what Amanda Lawrence talks about, that 501 and a half baby. So I'm nearly on her level um, while I weigh more than her. So anyway, <laughs> so the point being is that um, when you look at the average bell curves, the average male is heavier than the average female. And even when they're at the same body mass, the average male has a large proportion of fat-free mass to fat mass. So when you say that energy expenditure is explained by fat-free mass, you're going to see a lot of what are not truly sex differences per se, but are differences between men and women when they're at the same age or potentially even the same body mass. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and this, I think there's not a whole lot to, to say in addition to that on the topic of energy expenditure, Omar. But I think people would be surprised just how much body composition explains the differences between men and women. So uh, there's there's a classic uh, resistance training text by um, Mike Stone, who's you know kind of one of one of the one of the godfathers of periodization, and also does a lot of work with weightlifters uh, and has coached them at, at a very high level. I think still still sends athletes to uh, national championships and does a lot of work with them. Uh, and in that book. Um, there is a table that compares the relative performance of elite female and male lifters. And when you control for lean body mass, uh, if you look at this table in this book, you can see that the female lifters are actually snatching and clean and jerking between 91 to 93% of the males. Now, obviously, if you're just to compare similar weight classes, you see something more like a 60, 70, 80% of, of males, depending on, on, on the weight class. But when you control for lean body mass, that difference gets way less. Now, I, I wrote about this in mass, and of course, none other than Greg, Greg Knuckles, who did his master's specifically on sex differences, said, hey, even more than that, if you were to control for skeletal muscle mass, not just lean body mass, which is the same thing as fat-free mass, all non-fat tissue in the body, that difference gets even smaller. And I thought about it. I was like, oh, that's interesting because, of course, women have more organ tissue mass. They have more things to support uh, potential pregnancy and giving, giving birth, right? So, uh, and he, he linked me to a study where they started to, to do some comparisons relative to skeletal muscle mass, and they found that per unit of lean body mass, men have more skeletal muscle mass. So it would be really interesting to see in the future if we can get some uh, more finely tuned uh, metrics of, of body composition to actually do relative strength comparisons scaled to skeletal muscle mass rather than to just lean body mass, which is a little grosser. And I think that would probably explain the majority of that, you know, seven to nine percent difference that remains. Uh, and we would start to see that. I mean, it makes sense, though, when you think about it, like what's going to be the, be the primary explanatory body composition variable for strength? Skeletal muscle mass, right? Like uh, not surprising. So anyway, I just think that's interesting. Um, another thing I think is worth saying, and this is, a, again, like, like I threw a, a low-density bone to our older listeners, I want to throw a bone to, uh, to women who might feel like, well, yeah, that doesn't help me because I live in the same world a, as men, and I, I feel like I'm at, I'm at a disadvantage when it comes to energy expenditure and my nutrition goals. And I would say that's not completely unfounded. Like if you go to IHOP, they don't yeah. have a your average body mass is less plate. And we know just how much uh, like social norms influence eating behavior, right? So 
most people eat the majority of what's on a plate. So if you have a bigger plate with more food and you have a lower energy expenditure, even if relative fat-free mass is the same, but your absolute number is different, that's tough because that means that exerting the same level of restraint for both people is going to result in two different outcomes. The person who weighs more is, 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 is probably going to be a little, a little better in, in the modern world than the person who doesn't if we're talking about a similar body composition, right? I also uh, have talked about this previously uh, in Iron Culture, uh, just the importance of activity. And that we, you know, there are fatalistic narratives about how, you know, increasing energy expenditure is not effective for fat loss, but what it is very effective for is body weight maintenance, not just because it increases energy expenditure, but rather because it helps regulate satiety. So you could take two people with very similar body masses, uh, but one person is less active. And in that same in food environment, they're going to have a harder time actually uh, eating an appropriate amount of calories to not be in a surplus because they simply don't have as well-regulated satiety hormones. So the example that, that you might think about is, okay, let's take a married couple. One person is heavier uh, and one person is more active. Uh, it's the same person is heavier and more active. The other person is uh, lighter and less active. Uh, and we could look and go, yes, they have the same relative energy expenditure for fat-free mass. That would still be true. However, that lighter person who is less active for the reasons I mentioned above, uh, or previously, I should say, is going to have a harder time in, in, in the modern food environment. Like a married couple are generally eating out together. Uh, they are doing things together. So they're going to be exposed to the same commercials. They're going to you know, take a walk together and they're both going to smell the Subway cookies, right? And you know how those Subway cookies smell. Uh, way better than the sandwiches do, that's for sure. Uh, you know, they're going to go to the same restaurant, so they're going to get the same portion size, and the relative energy intake to that person's body mass is going to be higher for the less active person who lays we weighs less. The person who is, you know, weighing less and less active is probably going to want to eat three cookies, just like the person who's heavier and more active, but guess what? They're heavier and more active, so three cookies is going to produce a smaller surplus. So this can still result in someone who is smaller, who on average women intend to be smaller, feeling like they're on the back foot in the modern quote-unquote obesogenic food environment. So I don't want to discount that, but I do want to say that there's not a physiological difference in this aspect uh, between men and women. It is a function of, of uh, body composition, which I just think is interesting, and, and many sex differences are. Eric, that was a clinic, my man. As a man of science, uh, I will say two, two points, uh, two points. The first, fascinating incredibly true when you think about it the social norms that we have you go to a restaurant of course most of us how we've been conditioned you eat what's on the plate it is basically male centric the entire menu because you want large portions there's also the incentive in general when it comes to restaurants where you want to feel like you get your fill so you come you sign up you order a plate but it's not it's not then proportional to the person's body weight or what one would need to eat in order to meet their goals or whatnot it is skewed on the larger end, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. you can't say, oh, let me have that. Well, give me give me just like two thirds of what you normally uh, cook, right? Like theoretically you could think about it, but you've been standardized and normalized to understand that this is the portion. You go to Subway, you get a cookie. It's not like, well, can I have a cookie that would be appropriate for me? Like me personally, it's just the one. And so it's, it's skewed heavily in a larger uh, 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 size. And I, I could see immediately, as soon as you said that, it made a, a ton of sense. The social pressure that uh, is put on people, that uh, that's put on women, to make some of these choices too, where you said the environment, I, st I can't forget the line that, yeah, Krieger said just in general, where he said that uh, oh, he feels that partial obesity is partially a consequence of just capitalism, like just market indicators and all these things, like fight, fighting for one's dollars, trying to make things, uh, you know, as tasty as possible to incentivize people like, oh, I want, I want to get this and portions and all the other things where we're just inundated with all this uh, marketing and the algorithms essentially eclipsing our innate biological impulses or ability to control some of these uh, signals. Really, really tough stuff. But I will say the positive to like whoosh, bookend it was like that shit. Like we don't like Eric. You and I, we go in there, you met up in Toronto, what you want. We can order whatever we want, because guess what? Our bodies can take it, right? Because it's standardized basically to accommodate us, and we're two hunky males that are quite active. Um, so we don't even have to double think those things. I will say to bookend it, though, with something positive, mm. will be, I, I do like how um, some of these ideas have been challenged, or these notions of like, you know, like women in lifting, as an example, of the ability to put on muscle work, the work, a lot of the work that Greg Knuckles did, in terms of the ability to synthesize muscle, is far higher than people anticipated. Let's say, 10, if you were to ask even coaches or trainers 10, 20 years ago, like, hey, what do you think? 
that uh, the ceiling's a lot higher. And I will share this anecdote that your client, my friend, Jessica Bittner, we've always said Bittner, Bittner might be listening to this episode. I don't know. She's like, guys, I just skim it. Anyway, shout out to Bittner. Um, when she came to Toronto recently, and uh, she's someone who is, I would describe as well muscled, right? I think at like 5'7, five, 5'7 seven, five, seven and change, between 80 and 82 kgs right now, it's like 175, 180 pounds. She was lamenting, Eric, that she was on your helping her. She's getting ready for Worlds. She's going to crush it. In fact, by the time this is out, I can only assume she won. Congratulations, Bittner. Uh, but anyways, lamenting, Eric. This is funny. Just think about this as an example. She was lamenting the fact that she had to lose weight or had to you know, uh, do a little body recomp on 2,000 calories. The Basically, 2,000 calories is low for her, right? For her standards, because she's very active. She has a, a standing job, right? Uh, she's a pharmacist. In addition to all her physical activity, in addition to all the muscle mass she's accumulated via hard lifting over time, and you think about that and we think about like, you know, near the end, like for you, you're getting ready for a show or, or myself, like, you know, various phases. It's not that different. The calories that we're eating, right? Once it reaches that threshold. So I think there is some potential uh, room for encouragement or a pause uh, in order to uh, reflect and think about these things. Like, well, what does this actually mean for me personally that, hey, building some of that muscle mass there, staying active, like some of the things that calories one uh, can then ingest. And then you describe that at J curve of overall physical activity, satiety signals. There's a lot of kind of, I would say, undercover positivity or ways to uh, interpret this information to your betterment. 100%. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I will say that there is a greater than nine out of 10 chance that right now, as you listen to this, uh, Jessica Bittner is the world champ of the 76 kilo class and uh, big shout out to her. It was an honor to, to uh, be working with her for a little more than the last year, I think when we, we first started working together and uh, yeah, just amazing athlete. And, and yeah, let's just put it this way her numbers to, to drop down from a relatively high body weight. Cause she was, she was trying to hit that 200 pound goal, uh, body mass, which was <laughs> challenging to get up to, but she got close. Um, you know, to really put on some good muscle mass and coming back down, never had to get under a number that started with two. So yeah. Uh, and you guys have heard what I've had to diet on to get to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's say a similar body mass a, 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 as Jess. So, uh, yeah, there are definitely, uh, you can see how when you do start to look at people with similar amounts of muscle mass, yeah, you, you don't see huge differences. Um, there are big individual differences we'll get into next, don't get me wrong, but they're probably not in like the relative energy expenditure per unit of fat-free mass. It probably has more to do with things like NEAT and uh, physical activity and whatnot. So anyway, uh, yeah, just to kind of cap this off, the, the, the sex differences, uh, while they're not true sex differences, I do think we need to you just, just say like, yes, people of different body masses in the same society, they're going to struggle, you know, uh, so uh, different differently, I should say. Um, so I mentioned earlier that probably what surprised like the general reader of the study was the age related stuff and maybe the sex related stuff. What blew my socks off is, is sort of a sex difference or it's, it's related to biological sex and that is pregnancy. So in addition to the, the, the principal, like nearly 6,500 people in this study, they also had uh, just under 200 uh, women who were uh, either uh, in the, in, dur during pregnancy or in the postpartum period, and they looked at their energy expenditure. And what really surprised me is that their relative energy expenditure was not that different from uh, adults who are, who are not pregnant, which shocked me. Like I would think like if you've got a human being rapidly <laughs> growing inside of you, right? <laughs> like you would see a higher, a higher energy expenditure per, for unit of fat-free mass. But I think a couple things is that a fetus isn't that large. And one thing that, that I did not know uh, was that the, the most rapid phase of growth in humans is not actually during pregnancy, but it's actually like in the first year of life after pregnancy. Mm. Um, and the authors cited, and obviously this isn't my area, you know, maybe there's some people in the, uh, in this area, maybe, maybe, you know, like Marika or Molly are shaking their heads and they're like, Herman Ponser is an idiot. So I, I could be wrong. Again, this is not my area of expertise, but the authors cited some, some, some data on this showing basically backing up, you know, this observation and saying, you know, where you start to see, uh, you know, a de like a capping on the stature of people, like they, you know, if like Omar, you know, this is a historian or an amateur historian that people hundreds of years ago, and especially thousands of years ago, like average height was like five feet tall, you know, uh, a lot of that was related to malnourishment. And if you 
there's a critical period in uh, maturation where like in the first year of life, if a child is not fed, you see like stunting of growth long-term. So that's what the author cited. They said, hey, you know, where we do actually see the highest energy expenditure relative to fat-free mass is in the first year of life, post-pregnancy, after being born. And, and that may be where if we'd measured that, you know, if, if, if humans were a different type of mammal – that, that carried their, uh, their, their young to term for two years or something like that. Maybe that phase would be it. Uh, but uh, that's probably not very evolutionary. <laughs> uh, the, the advantage, you know, to have that much energy expenditure required for someone who is massively pregnant and has to have trouble, you know, navigating in the same way they would when they were not. So anyway, a little bit of a evolutionary tangent there. But interestingly enough, um, on average, or at least relative to, to, uh, to fat-free mass, uh, during pregnancy and immediately afterwards, apparently energy expenditure is not higher. Again, relative energy expenditure. Your total might be higher or might be lower if you can't be quite as active. Um, but uh, like, I, I don't want people to think that their energy expenditure is indifferent, but the, the relative changes and the contribution of fat-free mass is, relative, is pretty much stable between uh, pregnant and non-pregnant and non-pregnant and postpartum women, which is honestly surprised the shit out of me. Eric, 2002, weight moves weight, right? Your baby's right. in there putting in the work for you. That's right. That's right. Uh, you want to get stronger? You just need someone. You need a spotter, an <laughs> yeah. internal spotter. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Internal coaching cues. No, but uh, That's right. you, you said, so here's what's so cool. It's basically three major points wrapped up into one article that's reviewing this research here. We spoke then about uh, the notion that as one ages, hey, it, it, might not, it might not actually dip as you think it is, uh, your metabolism, or why it potentially uh, can Two, then sex differences or the lack thereof between men and women. Three, individual differences, the high individual variability, which I think people, you might think you can anticipate where, once again, I like how you phrased it about those activity factors. Like, hey, I get it, right? Large population, you're trying to help as many people as possible. You're trying to calculate your daily caloric expenditure, what you need to eat, da, 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 maintenance, da, da, da. And Eric, to your point, they are very funny because think about how uh, grossly off they can be. Was like I'm a 1.2, right? Like, what's your activity? I feel like I'm a 1.2. But can you get yep. into the individual differences between people then, and how that is basically of paramount importance when you're trying to have this discussion and when someone's trying to figure out some of these things for themselves? Yeah, I think I want to start with a little bit of a preamble of how this finding. It's not a finding per se, but it's something you can see when you look at the data. Um, it addresses not a, a nihilistic or, or fatalistic narrative, like kind of the sex differences or especially the age differences we talked about, but it basically addresses the, the lies we tell ourselves, right? So there are times when humans want to be the exception to the rule, and there are the times they want to be average, right? So most people just assume that they're smack dab in the middle of the bell curve and that they can go online and use a macro calculator or an energy expenditure calculator uh, or they can go look at, you know, some smart person's estimation of how much muscle mass, what's the maximum muscle mass I can have based on my height? You know, oh, FFMI, that explains everything I need to know. Like, th there, there seems to be, in different contexts, people who want to believe that everyone is the mean or that I'm the exception to the mean. So when it comes to, like, drug side effects <laughs> or, or risk aversion, they think there are, it's not going to be them. You know, this is this is the teenager who doesn't wear their seatbelt and speeds and thinks it, it it won't be me. Like there won't be someone on the road who maybe just breaks a little late or or turns without looking, um, and I'll be fine. Uh, or this is the person who, like Ben House recently talked about, uh, decides to go on HRT and is shocked that they got acne and alopecia. You know, um, you know, or it's the person who is like, uh, you you calculated your macros wrong. Like that that's not you, and it's like. Bro, I'm maintaining weight and everything's going on on the scale. Yes, I eat 600 grams of carbs a day and I weigh 140 pounds. Like, oh, you're lying or you're on DNP. Like, okay. You know, like, because outliers don't exist, right? Come on. Yeah. So so I think it, it's just this, this funny thing where uh, in different contexts, people really struggle with the idea of individual differences um, and in very non-logical ways. So like I said, this isn't a true finding of this study, but if you look at all the figures that are presented both in the supplementary data and in the principal study, uh, you can just look, they actually have the dots, uh, like the, you can see the full spread of the data represented graphically. And so I was looking at the energy expenditure for people at the same amount of fat-free mass, and I was just 
I thought I just thought it was wild how, how different it could be. So for example, if we take 60 kilograms of lean body mass, right, which that's, I think, a decent proxy for like the, the average person. So, so 60 kilograms is like 132 pounds, right? So if you're 150 to 170 at a low moderate to high moderate body fat percentage of either sex, that's, a de- that, that's close to your amount of, of lean body mass, right? Um, so if you look at like the lowest dot and the highest dot, they're really far apart. Now this won't mean anything to you if you're, you know, your, your standard person reading this because it's in uh, megajoules a day. And most people don't know how to calculate, you know, energy expenditure in, in, uh, calories from megajoules. But so I did that calculation. I put it in the article and the lowest dot is just under 2000 calories. So that means, you know, someone with, like I said, between probably 150 and 170 pounds could be burning, 1900 calories a day. That's really low. Okay. That means 160, 170 pound person to diet and be in a 500 calorie deficit needs to eat 1400 calories a day. And that's the person who like, no, you're, you're, you're the coach is like, uh, I think you're mistracking. Uh, you're, you're lying about your food, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, and they're the person who constantly feels like what is wrong with all these energy expenditure calculators? Like they're they're out of their mind. I would explode if I was eating 2,500 calories a day, and that's supposed to be me on a diet. So that that's a reality. Uh, and then if you look at the highest dot, it's like right around 7,000 calories a day, Omar. Yeah. 7,000 calories. Crazy. That's crazy. So, uh, right? So sometimes I will talk about, uh, I'll compare myself to Alberto uh, because I think it, it, it explains just like, but I'm like low moderate and he's like high moderate if we were to kind of compare us to these outliers. And I weigh more than him. So like just – so I walk around at, uh, at just like like 205 to 210, right? He walks around between 175 to 185, you know, like his heaviest, okay? So there is a 20 to 30-pound difference between us in the off season, and he competes just under 160. I compete around 180. So let's say there's a 20-pound difference between us in probably lean body mass. So – Considering that, we're not that different, but he is dieting on typically over 3,000 calories, and I'm typically dieting on just under 2,000. So we're talking about like a 1,200-calorie difference to get the similar condition, and I weigh 20, you know, 20 pounds more. That's a big difference, but that is totally eclipsed by people of the same body mass, one person eating or expending 7,000 calories a day and one person expending 1,900. That means one person is dieting on 1,400 calories. The other person is dieting. <laughs> on 6,500 calories to get the same relative deficit. And that's mind boggling. We're talking about almost a fourfold difference for two people with the same amount of fat-free mass. And both of them are probably gonna be someone who's like, I need coaching. Like, I'm a hard gainer. No matter what I do, I can't gain weight. It's because you gotta eat like what Michael Phelps thinks he's eating, but actually isn't. Like you do need to actually eat, you know, the Michael Phelps diet. While the other person is gonna be really struggling to not get micronutrient deficiencies, you know, on a day-to-day basis. So it's just, they're just, you know, it, it can be a world apart when we talk about these outliers. And again, for all the coaches out there, you're going to get a disproportionate number of outliers because they're the people who are not generally served by cookie cutter advice. Eric, two things. First, would you agree potentially that those that seem to struggle uh, in order to lose weight, there's probably a higher propensity of them that might be on the lower end where some of the coaches that tend to think, of course, there can be compliance. There's, there's many, many factors into this. But if you're already trying to find a coach to help you and you think that you have the general proficiency of tracking calories and you plug in the numbers and basically you're following it, but it seems like you're not losing weight, there is the compliance issue and many other factors. But probably out of that portion, that population, there is a higher portion of people that are on that lower end because they naturally find themselves, they're making these calculations and the calculations are basically off for them. Would you think that's probably the case? Uh, Sure. So it doesn't help. Like. No one, no one's getting a fat loss advantage from burning, uh, you know, a thousand calories less than what would be considered a low energy expenditure for a certain amount of mass. So, like, I'm not going to deny that probably other factors, on average, are going to be a greater impediment. You yeah. know, like, uh, you know, the social cultural things we've talked about many times on Iron Culture and even within this episode. But 100, percent if you are one, two, three, or four standard deviations <laughs> below the energy expenditure that would be expected. Uh, for your level of body mass, yes, that that only makes it harder, you know, for sure. 
or because that's what I was gonna say. We're talking like one standard deviation, like sixty-six like uh, percent of the population, like what have like as you get further and further away. These people do exist. Like you said, there is the real mm-hmm. Michael Phelps, like Michael Phelps, like the dot that he didn't actually is like that person exists. How much can we explain? Because I have a funny aside, the second point I was gonna make about my brother fidgeting, need all these other factors to explain the difference. Cause your Alberto is basically my brother. And he brings up because he keeps what's funny. He he's a musician, but he keeps abreast of uh, these things. Like he, uh, or reads a mass. He reads, uh, some of your articles and so forth where I joke with him. This is a true story as you, when you diet, uh, alongside in conjunction with Alberto and you notice he can afford to eat more calories. It's the exact same thing with my brother, who there is a 20 pound on average, at least difference. There's probably a 20 pound difference in muscle mass. We did this, Eric, a decade ago. And what he brought up, because he's like hip with all this stuff. He said, yeah, but like the fidgeting, like I move around more and, you know, neat. Like we can't, we can't uh, 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 discount these factors. And I was like, bro, this was 10 years ago when we did together. We got, I told you, like, that was a joke. We did the uh, cyclical ketogenic diet, just we died it mm. down anyways, did, did all the fads, cool, whatever, did get lean. But I would notice that despite me weighing 20 or 30 pounds more than him, and I'm not just trying to boost myself when I say I was complying 100%, like there was, it wasn't, you know, I had like a cheat day, like Eric, like there's a hit in 2003. I, I can easily admit that. Like if I went off, I went off, but I didn't. And he was getting easier and as far leaner than him. He brought up those factors, right? And I said, yeah, man. I said to my brother, I said, but I was working as a trainer at the time and I had a pedometer on me and I was taking 16,000 steps. Like you're active. It's not like I wasn't active and I would put forth, I would pause it, Eric. That's why I want to know from you, the individual, some of these individual differences and what they can be and how, uh, uh, you know, uh, impactful uh, they can be. I would say that my overall activity level was the same as his, if not higher, because I was at the time I was working 12 to 14 hours a day. I know my steps. It was like 15 or 16,000. And even still, the calories were inverted from what people would expect. He was eating more, losing more weight, and I was eating less and losing less weight. Yeah, we've talked about this previously. There, there are there are people with a overall spend thrift pattern and a thrifty pattern. So there are people who in response to a calorie deficit, they will have compensatory reductions in energy expenditure uh, that are far greater than others, and others will see almost no reduction, you know? And that is, so yeah, that, that's also a difference between Birdo and I. Like, his numbers are very stable relative to body mass. Like, what's, like he doesn't have to make a lot of changes, um, and I'm, I'm not. So you can not only have these these people who at the same body mass might burn lesser or fewer calories, but also their adaptations in response to a deficit <laughs> yeah. can differ. And those two things can can like coincide. So you can have someone who doesn't burn a lot of calories just even in a surplus. And they go in a deficit and the calories go down even more. And you can have someone else who just always burns a lot of calories relative to their body mass, even when they're f- like 6% body fat, you know? Um, and yeah, so like I think People need to understand that these individual differences are very real. It's one thing when you see a bunch of people reporting online that they're eating 1,200 calories and not losing weight, and they'd be like, yeah, that's far more likely, probabilistically, and this is an accurate statement, that the majority of those people are actually just misreporting or forgetting about things or not actually even taking in 1,200 calories. So there's errors, right? Um, but when you look at doubly labeled water data, like even if you assume the maximum error there, that person that's, that's eating 1,900 calories is at most eating 2,000 calories. So it's like, <laughs> like it's 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 yeah, still you miscounted, way, bro. It's way actually 2,000 calories. Yeah, sorry, I was off by 100, right? Yeah. And I was off by five percent. So the like, it just it like it's it's just undeniable, and and I think it's just really important for trainers or individuals to know that that could be your client, that could be you. Um, and, and it's, it's rough on either end of the spectrum because if you are the person who's burning three times what would be expected or two-thirds of what would be expected, none of the calculators are going to make sense online. And yeah, you're just going to have to uh, start to go off of actual data in yourself and you're probably going to be annoyed by comments online if you go into a Reddit and ask questions because they're going to assume uh, you're – you're a hard gainer who thinks you're eating more than you are or that you are a uh, just just someone who does not attract calories and you're eating far more than you think or you're lying, you know? Eric, I, I think thus far you've removed so much uncertainty, which I think that's part of the kernel behind some of the fatalism 
or the nihilism that people experience and then they talk about because they have perhaps a certain expectation of the way things should be. And then when it doesn't match their perceived notion of reality, that kind of friction creates some of that disillusionment, right, is what I think. And Mm -hmm. I think arming people with then the proper framework to understand these things and also the power there's more personal pressure because once you know that individual differences are real and these are major considerations and you can't simply kind of, you know, give the power over to someone like, Oh, like, yeah, I'll just plug it in the calculator. Like it'll it'll do the work for me. Right. Like there's, there's a, a certain amount of personal responsibility one must take into their own fitness journey. And we kind of alluded to that about the, the idea, man, I can't even begin to understand, like, let's say being 50, having a family work obligations where it's, it's super stressful. And I, I do think it's super naive of certain trainers or people where they can't understand that greater context of what someone else is experiencing subjectively and how some of these actions can be hard. So I'm not trying to discount that in the slightest when you have all the, like, think about it. Like we work for ourselves. Like I work for myself, uh, get like, get, do this, all that. Like it is very privileged in so many ways. And to not remember that then, and it's like, well, why can't you do, I guess the difference between you and I is just our motivation and our dedication. I'm like, that came from a repository of momentum that you're able to establish like tiny victories that then instilled the sense of confidence and and competence in me that then allows me to make that stepwise motion towards getting better. Right. So I, I'm not, I'm not trying to discount that, but what I think is one of the great positive underlying messages of everything that you covered is just one like hey there's a lot of benefits to lifting or remaining physically active that exists outside of just looking really really good naked like how i wanted eric to do for this episode which was really going to be the focus but then we decided to do the second topic which was a very important topic other there's major major benefits and then also for uh, the sex differences or the lack uh, uh, thereof like uh, for women listening to this episode or the the role of uh muscle mass that you know it can have uh, widespread positive benefits and then lastly come on individual differences talking to people was like well wait a second maybe if you are tracking honestly and once again we look at the distribution and the likelihood there are people out there where they're doing everything right and there might not be experiencing the results and when we kind of give the recommendations for the on average like yeah it works for most people like over 50 percent. it's like some people can fall through the cracks so i think giving people the tools to understand themselves and then what they can do maybe to make some uh, alterations, man, that's, that can be something very profound. I agree. And, you know, I was thinking about the, uh, the archetypal 20 something trainer working with the archetypal middle-aged client. Yeah. And like you said, often the advice, and this is, sort of not the fault of the trainer because they, 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 like it would be great if they could empathize with that person, but it's very difficult when they're half their age at least and just don't have that experience and it is harder. The only really advice they can typically give them is try harder, you know? And man, like how often is that the type of advice we get? And that's not just in the fitness community. Like you go on Reddit and you are struggling with anything, learning to play the guitar, trying to be better at a video game trying to get in better shape, which is obviously what we're talking about. And there's going to be at least a number of comments that really boil down when you, when you, when you kind of simplify it to try harder. And that's a funny thing. I was thinking about it. We could probably do an episode in and of itself just on this topic, so I won't go in too much here. But 100%. there are times when try harder is useful, but a lot of the times it's not. And I think try harder is useful advice when someone thinks that there is something wrong. There's something wrong with me. Like I don't have the hand-eye coordination to play guitar, right? There's something inherently wrong with me. And if someone online goes, look, I felt exactly like that 10 years ago and I just kept practicing, they can go, okay, well, it's not that. So maybe I can just delay my frustration a little longer and keep practicing and I'll get better. And, you know, more often than not, they'll get better at, at whatever skill they're trying to practice. So that, that is a useful instance of saying try harder, but it had the very important step first of normalizing their experience. It wasn't just try harder, you slob, right? So I think, I think that's important because, and, and you can use some of this data to do that. Some people will come and be like, I think there's something wrong with me. You know, how often do we hear the whole, uh, maybe, my, maybe my thyroid is low. Maybe I'm, right, I'm, I'm hypothyroid. And you get it, you can get it checked or you can have someone you know, explain to you that, you know, well, even if you do, it's probably only going to be a 10% reduction in energy expenditure. It just means you have to eat less. You're not fundamentally broken. In fact, 
I had this other client who thought that was the case. Here's what happened. Here's what we did, right? So yes, there is a time and a place for try harder when it's preceded with that. Uh, when it's not helpful is just when it's just straight up, like, you just gotta, you just gotta work harder, you know? Um, so yeah, and I think when when you do have a life experience and you're able to empathize with someone, then try harder is not just necessarily a, a blanket prescription. You normally give them, here's how you can try harder. You can actually give them tools because you face similar things, either working with clients of, of, of a similar predicament uh, or in your own personal experience. And I think that's where it can be useful. Um, to some degree, though, that can be done out of a state of arrogance. Like, for example, if you're a 45-year-old trainer and you have a 45-year-old client, you obviously love fitness so much that you made it your career. What do you do between clients? You eat cans of tuna and get and get sets in, right? Now, if you don't actually believe that people who like fitness are inherently superior people, like they're the, the, the master race because we do fitness, then you can't, therefore, just basically tell people, well, you need to be like me. So it needs to come from a place of, well, because of my interest in fitness, I figured out practical solutions and how to get in fitness and change my dietary habits. Not, you need to just love this so it happens organically, right? So I think that that's another example of where try harder can, can go wrong, even when you do have that same life experience or you can speak to them on the same level with empathy. The final thing I would say is that try harder can be useful for people when they have a high level of self-efficacy, right? So for example, uh, and generally in my life, I have certain things where I don't have high self-efficacy and I have certain things where I do. Um, things where I have self-beliefs about, I'm just not good at that. Like, I'm, it's really good that I don't have to go back and take high-level math courses because I have some, some mental blocks about Eric Helms' ability in math, right? And I think this is probably part of the reason why I'm not like really, really great at stats. And I do, do think I'm probably not that good at math, but I think it compounds by the fact that I don't think I can be good at math, right? So when tell, someone tells me just try harder at math, that, that really falls upon deaf ears. But in another example, I think I have a natural affinity to be above average at video games than I play, right? Because most of the time when I play with other people, I tend to have better hand-eye coordination. I'm better than them, right? On average, there's definitely people, there's tons of people better than me. Trust me, I've learned that the hard way. Um, but so if someone tells me you just need to practice more, then my first thought is, okay, I will get better with as, as with I practice. I can become better. And then I naturally start to think of, well, let me figure out ways to practice better, more efficiently. And that comment actually spurs me to then go and do more investigation on my own. They didn't directly help me. But if someone has self-efficacy telling you need to put in more hard hours, they will try to figure out how to do those hard hours. But those are some pretty narrow bands of when just saying try harder can actually help them. Okay, now you're assuming that your client already has self-efficacy. Well, a lot of people coming to personal trainers don't have self-efficacy in the arenas of fitness and health. That's why they've hired you. So telling them just try harder in that arena, probably not a good idea. Also, definitely not helpful if you can't give them practical tools and they don't have self-efficacy, right? So just, just these are things to think about um, when we talk about this stuff. But certainly, it is very valuable to help people know that there's not something inherently wrong so they don't become uh, nihilistic. And they don't go, well, it's not even worth trying because I, I am fundamentally broken, just like every other, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 year old, for example. Eric, beautifully said. I completely agree. We can do a whole episode. That'll be, we'll have the guests, we'll do some other ones, we'll get back to that duo, the whole try harder, dispelling some of those ideas, the preconceived ideas, I think would be wonderful. I do want one minor correction, I would say, or I would like to make one, and that is we are the master race because we lift. We know, Eric, just due to the simple fact that we do three times 10 on bicep curls grants us numerous benefits. I mean, uh, immunity against novel viruses is just one small one that of course we know, right? Right. Like, like we do the bicep curls, the immune gets supercharged up and away we go. Right. Um, so I have read that online. So that's probably true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And people report like, Hey, I haven't gotten it yet. And I work out therefore working out, maybe not get it. It's very, it's ironclad. You can't, no, you mm. can't refute it. And if you, you know, do, yeah. Uh, Omar, I was just thinking about that. I yeah. also have not been hit by a car yeah, or yeah, died yeah. in a plane crash. Yeah. So this lifting thing is doing a lot <laughs> more than we think it does. It's not just for being jacked. It prevents most things. In fact, if you lift and something hasn't happened to you, that's the cause. 
Eric, did you not say before in an episode that lifting basically, you said especially as you age, can lower mm. uh, all cause of mortality? If we just extend that like retroactively, so you're saying as you get older, and we're talking right now in the prime of our life, I think it's reasonable to assume that, you know, whoosh, protect a bubble. Yeah, I think if we say, instead of going, hey, look, all cause mortality is correlated, uh, is, is, it has, has, is lower and that's correlated with physical activity, and instead of we go, all causes of mortality are reduced and that is caused by <laughs> lifting weights, then it would not be wrong to state that <laughs> lifting weights stops bullets. Man, look, guys, anyone that wants to refute this is clearly not only a hater, but they're part of the lamestream media. And so you know what to do with them, where you automatically discount. You you can't you can't encourage voices that don't support your own personal world view. And that's basically what we're indicating right there. Uh, where we it, uh, spoke about personal responsibility. We're trying to give the soft pitch because we're going to give the much harder pitch that you won't know is coming your way and it's just going to knock you flat, which will be masculinity in crisis 2022. There is a lot I do want to say about the whole try harder, but I, I'm just going to, hey, Eric, there's been so much covered and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, uh, how will we say, uh, uh, selectively piece ourselves into these episodes where it's like, oh, we could go another 30 minutes. But I, I do think you covered so much. I am aware of sometimes the tangents we go on, which I think always come back to the tonic. So I think they are beautiful, but there is a lot that we spoke about. I think there are a lot of actionable, insightful items for people to take with them. I do want to give the floor to you because this is once again, part of mass. By the time this episode is out, it's based, it's, it's going to be October. So this is coming out late September, this episode, it's going to be early October, like October 1st, you could get this issue. So you can listen to this podcast and then you could read it after monthly application strength sports. There'll be the link, uh, in the description. But what else do you want to cover? What do you want to circle around to, Eric? Just so we we wrap this up into that neat bow. I will I will tie that bow for you. And and if you're still here in the final ten minutes of this podcast, I know you're one of the hardcore. Yeah. I know you've got some nerd in you. So I'm going to leave this <laughs> uh, more nerdy tidbit for the people who are going to appreciate it. So these are observations. I think that's an important thing to state that um, you know the, when you anytime you observe a lot of you know, correlations and you can see strong relationships between things. That's cool. But the authors did um, a really interesting analysis to kind of basically confirm the causes, or I should say, have more confidence in the causes of these age-related changes in energy expenditure. And they did what's called modeling, which is basically you take a real-world observation, which in this study, if we look at the age-related changes in energy expenditure, was that you see a rapid increase uh, you know, in relative energy expenditure from age zero to one, right? And that's that that maturation period that is the fastest that I talked about. And then it slowly declines from basically age one to age 20, so that the relative, uh, you know, energy expenditure to fat-free mass is getting lesser and lesser. And then it's stable from 20 to 60, and then it starts to go down after 60, right? So these three distinct phases, okay? Um, so, they tried to model that, like what is explaining this? So they used some mathematical assumptions around tissue specific metabolism. And they also used the existing data that I talked about earlier on physical activity. And they showed that if you model physical activity to stay the same over time, and if you model tissue metabolism to stay the same over time, you get something very different than what was actually observed in the real world. You just generally see like these linear increases over time in energy expenditure, which is not what happens, right? It stays stable and drops off after being high at first. However, if they model seeing physical activity start to decline in middle age and then steadily keep dropping off until end of life, and then if you model at the age of 60, you start to see tissue metabolism on a relative sense go down, then the model looks very similar to what was observed in the real world. So that's why, like, even though this is correlational data, we can't say that we know exactly what causes the uh, age-related declines in energy expenditure early in life and why they're higher, sorry, later in life and why they're higher early in life. Um, but we can say that, hey, when you model it based upon having higher physical activity as a child and then it declining after or into middle age throughout the rest of life, and if we think that tissue specific metabolism of organs starts very high, declines, stable, and then drops off at 60, that 
matches what's observed in the real world quite well. So it's quite likely that that's what's going on. So anyway, just for the nerds who are curious, uh, they, they had a, a model, and, and you can see that in the uh, supplementary data, which is open access, and I think that's kind of cool because it's a nice way of taking non-causational data and, and having some more confidence around some of the mechanisms of what's being observed. Eric, you gave them the tools. We talked about self-efficacy here on this episode here today and what we can do. You gave them the ability, the open access, to go ahead and take a look. Where can people find you, Eric, now is what I want to know. Every Monday, oh. they can find me oh. looking at you across oh. the world, Whoa. looking back in time, because <laughs> yeah. today it's Saturday for me, it's Friday for you, yeah. uh, and, and connecting like two ships in the night in different time zones at, but nonetheless the ships that they're they're colliding but they're they're not they're not crashing mm -mm. they're simpatico mm. on on the waves they're flowing together connected one's the pitcher one's the catcher it's just the the, the perfect yeah you know top top bottom whatever you want yeah. to call it they, they yeah. work together perfectly and depending on the perspective what the beauty in art is depending the which way you look will shift the understanding right top bottom bottom top mm. top bottom like they're 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 coexisting. It's like it's it's a quantum state, right? It's zero and one at the same time. Who can really say? Schrodinger's bottom. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> no, Eric. I just want to thank you because you did uh, raise this idea for an episode. I think it's underrated. Like, there's certain topics, and this is my own, obviously, personal subjective opinion, but I have been in the space for over a decade. There, we know this, and you basically got to pepper people with both what they want, so what they perceive. Oh, like this, like yeah, like of course, like building a roundtable about hypertrophy. Wonderful episode, no doubt. It's never a in quotation sexy topic, you know, talking about either aging or some of these factors right here. And, and even when you said, I think uh, you put it well, where you said sometimes people want to view themselves as the mean or the average, and other times they're like outliers. Where you have some of these conversations too, it's like, well, it doesn't really apply to me, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it doesn't really apply to me. Yeah. And it's because you don't have that experiential uh, advantage of knowing, like, you know, in 20, 30 years, wow, this is going to be super relevant for me, right? Like, you think, like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm 24, I'm the king of the world, the queen of the world, like, nothing really has bothered me. I like lifting because it makes me look good. Like, these considerations haven't hit you yet. Uh, yet. So it's almost like uh, someone in the future coming back and telling you, you know, like, in Back to the Future, like, Marty, wait a second. Uh, so it might not hit uh i think some people with how profound it is or the utility but with time what i enjoy is sometimes we see these on like the ig story or whatnot for ourselves where someone like just discovers iron culture and they're on, like on episode 12 and they just shout out it's like man that was a good episode like just you wait i i love the idea and that's why i think this is our library of alexandria oh i went there eric which is that it's a self-contained work right that is growing with time as we add more episodes but you could kind of come at any point this could be someone, Eric, we could be dead. This is what I said. I'm not trying to get too heavy at all. But bro, this could be 2022. Uh, like, uh, uh, you're like, 2022, we're both dead at 2022. I was going to say 2200. I'm like, come on, Omar. It gets a lot worse <laughs> after the Delta variant, yeah, folks. Yeah. <laughs> folks, oh, how naive and how optimistic they seem. Eric, can't wait to visit you in 2022. It's like, fun fact. They never visited each other. Little do they know. No, but the idea that someone could discover this right time and place far removed from here and they could find something of high utility and high value. Just a wonderful thing to uh, think about. So, Well said. Nothing nothing like knowing that in a post-apocalyptic dystopia, people are going to be listening to us while we're dead. Woo! Makes me feel good about what we're doing. 20, 2022, baby. Can't wait for those people from the future who listen to our deceased carcasses talk about these things. No, but I'll, I'll just say... I want to thank you all for this uh, topic. It was incredibly well covered. We look forward to seeing the people, what they say in the comment section below, how they really wanted that initial idea. Maybe it will be a special issue 200. Eric poses, Omar admires, uh, everyone wins. It's basically episode two. Like that's the title right there. Eric poses, Omar admires, in parentheses, everyone wins, right? Uh, but got, anyways, we go ahead. Three month, we got three months to get it done. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that is... Because um, then we'll be dead. Because <laughs> yeah, 2022 is happening. Um, you could go ahead and leave a rating review on iTunes. It does help us out. I mean, I think before the algorithm used to reward those things, it's still fun. We I take 
personal enjoyment, I'll say reading it because of all the references. It's like that's like reading a conversation you you're having with someone over a long period of time where they get the references and so forth. So go ahead, leave them a rating review. Uh, of course, it should be five stars. It goes without saying. We will be back every single Monday, and you could check out once again Mass Monthly Application Strength Sports. The link for that will be in the description. We'll catch you in that next episode.